perspective. My goodness. This is the first word that came into my head. Last week, I got a phone call from my brother, Mike. He called to tell me that he was going to take some time to help some friends who were dealing with substance abuse. Mike himself had some struggles along the years with this, many years. Through the power of positive belief, my brother Michael, through the willingness to change and a clear vision of who he wanted to be, he broke the vicious cycle of substance abuse. He called me to tell me that he was going to travel down to Florida to help a few friends who were dealing with this similar struggle. He had told me that he was going to dedicate his life to this as a medical student right now in addiction. Perspective changes everything. We got the call on Wednesday that Michael had been in a fatal car accident. Oftentimes, it'll knock you off your feet. Oftentimes, it provides a level of clarity and awareness and a new sense of consciousness that you just can't get any other way. I want us all to smile. Michael went through a lot. But he went out on top. That night, we got so many emails, Facebook requests, comments, all that social stuff of saying how Michael helped me. People just came in and said, he inspired me to break that vicious cycle. December 27th, 2013. I'm at the kitchen table with my daughter, Lila Grace. She's three. And she has in front of her a worksheet. It's got a number of shapes. There's a lot of worksheets nowadays in schools. You, you aware of this? It has a circle, a square, and a triangle. And then it has a circle, a square, and a blank space. I flipped at my little angel, and I said, Honey, what do you think goes in that blank spot? She says, Triangle, Daddy. I was so happy, so proud. She had her crayon in hand. She goes and puts it on the table. She takes her little finger, puts it on the triangle, and tries to move it over into the blank space. I looked at my wife, Dawn. I said, honey, this changes everything. You see, so many have been talking about the fact that this is a digital age or an information age or even the social age. Perhaps it's an age of networked intelligence. But the more I think about this, the more I think about my children and my work in schools, I can't help but think this is an age of infinite possibility. I like to study organizations, and for the last decade, I've been fascinated by how they learn. But most recently, I became incredibly interested in how they unlearn. I'm going to share some stories. This is a very unfortunate sight. You've seen this. It happens about every June in the state of New York. I asked the question, what role will education play? Unfortunately, a lot of times we're able to turn to excuses, such as tangible items, such as people, time, and money. I would argue that that is not our limitation. The limitation that we face is found in this riddle I've shown this riddle to fifth graders, and I've shown this to adults. Might you guess who gets it right most of the time? The answer to this question is that it's daylight. It's daylight. I really enjoy when folks give me really interesting and creative responses to this. <laughs> and fifth graders usually say, duh, it's daylight. But this is interesting. Because it makes me think about my daughter and my children and the world that they're growing up in. You see, as adults, 
We've developed these deeply ingrained assumptions about the way that we perceive the world. They refer to them as mental models. That's kind of what TED is about, disrupting those mental models, changing the constructs by how we see the world. I called the high school principal right after this experience happened with my daughter. I said, Glenn, you need to put a schedule together for me. The first week of January, I want to be a student for a week. I want to be a ninth grader, a 10th grader, 11th grader, and a 12th grader. The most difficult part of this for me was the fact that I was starving by eight o'clock in the morning every single day. <laughs> but the interesting thing is this. I employed a type of research design known as narrative inquiry. I wanted to be a kid. I wanted to take notes and experience life like them. And so I jotted down all my feelings, frustrations, as if I was one of them. I remembered two things, Dante's Inferno and Conservational Momentum. These were two topics that teachers had spoke about in two different classes that I found myself so curious to pursue, but my notebook didn't go any further. My notebook didn't go any further. I wanted to go on a journey of learning with technology that would allow me to learn this stuff deeper than ever before. And so people have asked me all over, well, what did you find? What are you going to tell the world about this experience? World, we have yet to change our relationship with knowledge in most of our classrooms across this country. We have yet to change the relationship with knowledge. And so I started to think about intelligence, not just the other day, but a long time ago. Unfortunately, this happens to be my fourth grade Iowa test results. If you've seen this, there's, there's not much to celebrate here. Maybe one point. I'm not quite sure. But I started to think about intelligence a very long time ago, and I never stopped thinking about it. I wonder lately, how do we define intelligence in a digital age? Do organizations display intelligence? And can we, in fact, accelerate intelligence? I recently conducted a national study of school principals, virtual learning, and organizational capacity at Fordham University. And what that led to was actually many more questions than answers. But what we found that was so much more powerful today is that the ability to enhance and build your social capital is taking a whole new shape in virtual communities of practice. Social media tends to be the fuel or the backbone and the catalyst to these radical and awesome conversations. See, because we know that knowledge really isn't just in our heads, it's between us, it's right here. It's out there in virtual form. I wanna share with you an example of a wonderful website. It's my wife's, so I have to say that. Five years ago, she started a website called Raising Natural Kids. She's incredibly passionate about holistic and organic living. And so what we found was that she really couldn't find friends in the neighborhood to talk about this stuff. And how can you, when you have three kids under five, do anything besides take care of the kids? And so what she's created is this community online where mothers and fathers can go to get the support that they need, to ask questions that they need solutions to, and to accelerate their knowledge flows. I'm really excited to announce, I'm, I'm hoping my wife will agree that she's going to launch Raising Natural Husbands this fall. <laughs> but I must tell you that this changes absolutely everything. It changes everything. You see, for a long time, we were able to get away with the fact that our stocks of knowledge would do us well for a long period of time. But now the stocks that we have just go sour too fast. Whether we're a child or an adult, we have to participate in knowledge flows. Social media becomes a catalyst for that. Networks and communities create an accelerated flow of ideas. Last year, I completed my doctoral work at Fordham, actually two years ago, and I put up on Facebook, I wanted to give great thanks to some really smart people along the way that allowed me to participate in their knowledge flows. I never met most of these folks. But what happened next was amazing. I woke up in the morning, and a gentleman by the name of Don Tapscott messaged me. And as you can see, he says, get in touch with us about our latest work. 
Now, that's not really cool unless you know for the fact that Don Tapscott was just ranked the number four thinker in the world. That pales in comparison to one other story I'd like to share. My five-year-old son has something called sensory processing disorder. And that sometimes represents a challenge for my wife Dawn and I. And so rather than turning to books or all these other things that we can access, it occurred to me over the summer, hey, create a Twitter account, learning SPD. And now my Friday nights are not what they used to be. We had a rough day one day, quite honestly. And my son was a little angry, and we were having trouble regulating that. I threw a tweet out using this, and I got a response back from an occupational therapist somewhere. I don't know where she's from. She invited me to come join a webinar that was about to happen at 8 o'clock. I joined this webinar with her, an occupational therapist, and I learned more than I can learn about sensory processing disorder that I could uncover in any single book. The gentleman that you see here happens to be the lead neuroscientist at Stanford University, who is the one in the conversation with me as well with this webinar. This will change me and my ability to learn how to help my son in ways that never existed before. The more I think about this experience and this learning, I think about what's going on in this picture. This happens to be the start of an Ironman triathlon. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, a long time ago, as a college swimmer, I was okay being up here. As a large man, it was gradually more depressing as the race went on and we went to the bike and the run. But it was okay for me to be up there. And I think about the learning that I've done in these spaces, across these networks. And if you know that dragging behind people will actually help you. So as you start to draft off other people's learning, Start looking at social capital a different way. The communities that you join and be a part of, you might even be able to shape serendipitous learning. Can you imagine that? If we take a look at this through the entire organization, we notice something special. That organizations that continually learn and unlearn are not only drafting from people on the outside of the organization, but the important thing is that there's leadership in organizations, but never just one leader. There's a constant back and forth exchange of resources. This is my vision for a digital age learning organization. And to think that at some point along the way, the leadership will change, but we're all in sync trying to get to the same point. You see, a long time ago, actually in 2011, in Long Beach, New York, they hosted the Quicksilver Pro Surf Contest. The funny thing is, is that there wasn't a wave in sight. The ocean was 100% flat. They considered canceling this event. About a day later, they noticed something happening. It's a, something called the groundswell in the ocean. It's a deep force or pressure. Let's just think about this from the perspective of the world that our children are living in today. The tools that they have access to that perhaps we don't allow them to use in ways that they should. I spent 20 years on the ocean as a lifeguard. And one of the things that I loved is when everybody came up to us and said, when is high tide? And the reason why they do that is because they want to get to the top of the berm. It's like the best real estate on the beach. And interestingly, and this is a fun thing to watch at times as a lifeguard, the ocean starts to come up. And it comes up and it comes up and it comes up. And people start to move their blankets back. Eventually they get their blankets wet but they get super creative at times about blocking this incredible force. They'll ask their four-year-old to dig a hole. They might even ask them to take a surfboard or a boogie board. I've seen everything. The truth of the matter is, is that no matter what you do, if you back up too far, you'll be against the dunes or under the boardwalk with nowhere to go. I think a lot of people get in trouble with this. You see, so many people have said to me, the holy grail is coming. The iPad retina display. This device, that device, something like that. Folks, the holy grail are the people in our organizations. How do we unleash the human capital in our organizations? How do we cultivate their intelligence? By rethinking social capital and some new structures for leadership. See, I don't think this is true, the idea that people fear change. 
I actually think that people fear being changed. That's the art of leadership. How do we cultivate the collective intelligence of our organizations in ways that allow people to scale their passions and to do things that we never thought were ever imaginable? I want to think about our legacy. I don't want my legacy to be we help students do well on tests. I think we want our children to discover a love of learning, figure, figure out, out how to scale, scale their passions, passions, no matter what that is. I think that would be awesome. Thank you.